It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. I'm going to start with a quick introduction and then we'll move on to questions. So today's guest, the preeminent Ron Carter, as you can see before you, obviously needs no introduction. If you listen to jazz in any capacity whatsoever, you've most likely heard Mr. Carter's playing. As of 2015, the Guinness Book of World Records recorded Mr. Carter as the most recorded jazz bassist in history, with 2,221 recording credits at the time. So without further ado, welcome, Maestro. Thank you for the invitation, and how are you? I'm brilliant, thank you. Quite excited. So um, for our first question, we have from one reporter's opinion. I was at a show where you introduced My Funny Valentine as one of your three favorite songs to play. I always wondered, what are the other two? Um, my Ship, and um, but not for me. Lovely. Our second question from Charlie is, when and how do you know a composition you've written is worth keeping? When someone else plays it. <laughs> nice. Do, is there anyone in particular who you grant maybe particular credence to when they play it, or is it entirely? No, anyone, no, anyone who looks at my relatively small song library of 100 songs or so and uh, decides that one of them fits their mood or their band concept or their, their way of thinking about a melody, and they'll play it without me being next to them and pointing out things to them and say, no, that's not right. You can't do it. Again and again and again. You know, Someone who will do it on their own. I mm. trust their judgment that is valuable to them, and I'm happy that they found something that makes them comfortable to play. Have you ever had a song which you weren't particularly confident in maybe when you composed it? only for it to be popular among your peers? No, I, I trust my sense of judgment. I'm pretty pretty honest about my goods and bads stuff, and I'm not fooling myself. Nice. Yvonne asked, at what point did it become apparent to you that you were sort of the go-to hired gun of jazz bassists? Well, I, I kind of, uh, and not to make the person who made the question feel terrible, but I, I kind of think of me not as a hired gun, you know, that's that, that in the old cowboys, he was always the worst guy in town to fool with. Never a compliment. And I know that they didn't mean it in that fashion. But my age group, you remember in those days when that was not a nice thing to call somebody for me. Having said that, uh, I'm always surprised, actually, that people who are not in the jazz category, per se, have found out that my concept and my sound or whatever, my choice, whatever, appealed to them will help them in their projects uh, fruition of being a successful project. These people, as you may have mentioned, are not necessarily in the jazz community or known throughout the jazz, jazz lexicon of people who play jazz. And that these people who are not in my neighborhood, so to speak, think I can help them has always been uh, uh, pleasing and, and amazing that I've been able to make make what I do available to people who are not my neighbors, so to speak, hmm. and, and that they that they continue to call me for projects that are not uh, a, a, a smashing version of So What or you know a, a Trident kind of record that I'm pleased that I think I can help them make their music something special because they invited me. And was there any particular moment where you started, where you realized that you'd begun to branch out to these musical neighbors of yours, uh, perhaps maybe more so than your fellow bassists at the time? No, I just accept the call as a, going to work and hopefully I can get there on time and the guys, the, the producer is a nice person and mm. the band is a good bunch of good guys and gals and I look forward to meeting new friends and seeing how we can convert them to the jazz community if necessary. Mm. So it's not necessarily an active ethos of yours to kind of deliberately try and branch out. No, I, I, I'm just only a bass player in the band. Mm. Nice. Um, we have another question from Orion. Um, and I think this is especially relevant, granted a mm -hmm. relatively young audience today. But if you had any advice for yourself in your 20s, uh, what would it be? Continue to practice. I continue to have a, a focus when you go to someone else's job because it's important to make them feel that you belong there. Uh, 
always have a nice dark suit ready to go. If the gig is at eight o'clock, if you get there six, if if you get there at uh, seven fifteen, you're already late. Mm. And respect the leader's choices, whether you like them or not. And was there any of that that you didn't do in your twenties? No, I'm I'm pretty pretty straight laced guy. Nice. So no regrets in that regard. No man, that's, that that was almost seventy years ago. I, I can't uh, say. Man, I should have done this in, in 1975, 1975, 1975, no, 1959. No, I'm not that kind of person. Nice. Rat asks, how do you respond to days when your playing is just off? Say that again? How do you respond to days when your playing is just off? And how do you deal with musical ruts? I'm, I'm not sure what it mean. My playing is off and musical ruts. Can you can you give me a different def, another definition of that phrase? I suppose. Do you ever have days where you're just not as satisfied as you usually would be with how you're playing, or you feel like there's something? I guess a form of musical writer's block, where maybe you're reaching for something but you can't quite find it. Or have you ever had that? Well, you, you know, you know. Pardon me for a moment. No worries. Uh, I have a book out called Finding the Right Notes. And and the premise of this book, my, one of the premises is that I'm I'm constantly looking for the best set of notes or the right note to make a phrase have a life. Hmm. Or have make make a phrase do what I think it can do better with this set of notes or or, or that set of notes. You know. Uh with that kind of response answer to your questions, friend's question. Uh, I'm always looking for a better set of notes. And I'm never going along after the gig feeling, uh, hanging my head and saying, man, I just didn't do enough for this guy. Or I'm in the, no, I'm not, I'm looking for a better way. I, I'm, I'm thinking more positively about the notes that don't work because I got to find out where do they belong. Mm. What band needs these kinds of notes better than that band? Part of my job, Alfie, is to be sensitive enough to those needs and variances. And I think once I get to the zone, as this question applies, that I feel like I'm in a rut, uh, I may as well not play music anymore. Hmm. I go to work every night, Alfie, to get better. And if you have that view, as I have this view, these ruts or whatever they're called, these writer's block, I'm not part of that. I'm not part of that staff at all. No. So everything is constantly productive. Well, that's, that's my aim. Mm. You know? Yeah. Ah, I'm Falling asks, how did it feel to hear yourself on a record for the first time? Amazing. Mm. <laughs> Which record that, was that? Uh, Alfie, you're going back, way back, and much further than I can go back, but uh, I don't know, maybe Charlie Perseus, Jazz Statesman, or... or uh, Nat Wright, the greatest voice in jazz on Bethlehem, way, 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 way back. Yeah. Uh, I was just amazed that the, that the bass produces such a sound on record. Yeah. And has that ever worn off? Um, and I've kind of got used to hearing me on the record. record. I've kind of gotten used to hearing me on the record before, so I'm yeah. kind of over that, you know. I can imagine. Yeah, as the Guinness World <laughs> Record holder. <laughs> Sundance Kid 876 asks, how do you remember the jazz community reacting to you playing on hip hop albums, uh, such as A Tribe Called Quest Low End Theory? They were pleased to hear those guys finally hiring somebody to play live rather than sampling. They were thrilled that this group called Tribe Called Quest had the audacity and the comfort zone of their being to actually talk to me live. Mm. And invite me to be on their record. They were thrilled with that concept, with that with that option. Yeah, they were happy. They were happy for me and for the music. That's really nice. And have you ever had a particularly 
negative or mixed reception to anything that you've done musically? I may have, but I haven't been confronted with it. You know, no one said, hey, man, you did. No, I don't know those kind of relationships and haven't been forced to face a rather adamant response to my sudden notes or my sound from someone in the audience or the band. And I don't know that situation at all. Hmm. Question. Um, so, so it's never something Question, that's question to okay. you. Uh -huh. This person asked them, has that ever happened to them? What, what did they do? I'm just curious. Sorry? I'm just curious. Can you ask that person at some point, if you know who they are, has that ever happened to them? And what were the circumstances and what was their response? Okay, I will ask them. Yeah, I don't know that situation at all. Yeah, that's that's good because I was thinking in terms of because um, I know John Coltrane. Uh, it's been written that he was um, quite sensitive to criticism sometimes and um, took a lot of it on board. And it was his, it was the advice that he got from Mars Davis, if I remember correctly, which was effectively pay the critics no heed. Okay, well, I, I can't answer for either one of those people, of course. Uh, and and we, any artist, music, dance, painting, whatever the art is, are sensitive to people who, who put their efforts down. And I think that's part of the risk you take for doing what you hear. If mm. you not like it, man, well, okay, I like it. That's enough for me. Yeah. Um, Rory's Tear asks... Which studio sessions felt the most productive in the moment uh, or when you thought that this particular music was going to hit people hard? I, I, I'm never concerned with the music hitting people hard. I'm concerned with can I help this band mm. reach where they think they want to be and they've called me there to help them reach that spot. So it's all to and do I, And I've been to enough different studios that they all feel good in the studio. They may feel different tomorrow, or the playback, or the editing, or the mixing, but they, they all feel comfortable to me. Hmm. So you don't pay particularly much attention then to how you think it will be received. It's all entirely the energy. Well, we're all concerned with that, Alfie. I mean, the, the one who, anyone in the art is not a one-man crowd or a one-man rooting section. We all are in favor of someone, anyone, everyone, besides our grandmothers loving what we do. You know, and, and uh, anyone who says that the audience doesn't affect their view of how they sound, I think they're not being really honest in their opinion. But I, yes, I'm aware of that kind of stuff, and I kind of accept that, well, I didn't get to these people, but not because I didn't try my best, hmm. not because I wasn't looking for the right notes, and I can't affect their view of what I did, other than continue to play what I think is valid. Thank you. Um, Charlie again asks, uh, and he asked this shortly after his passing. Do you have any particularly great memories of playing with Barry Harris? Uh, we never made any gigs together, so I have to kind of quantify, qualify my comments. We made three or four recordings together, and it was always interesting, interesting to me to play with someone who was clearly out of the Bud Powell realm of piano playing. And uh, of course I enjoyed playing with him because he had a great harmonic sense, I like to play fast tunes all night, and and, and uh, he was a real gentleman as far as the music was concerned. I, I miss him. Mm. Did a record called The Magnificent, called Just Playing Magnificent on, a, on, I think, maybe Blue Note or Prestige. Nice mm -hmm. record. It's a blue cover record. He played, really played great. With, with uh, uh, Leroy Williams playing drums. One of the nice ones I made with him. Nice. Thank you. Um... I suppose on another kind of historical note, um, Josh Kay asks, and this is slightly more, I guess, unverified, but there are reports of you playing in Roy Haynes' quartet at Slugs with Wayne Shorter and either McCoy Tyner or Chick Corea. Um, did that group exist? And are you aware of any recordings that might exist from that period? I have no memory of that, of that combination. I remember, I remember the club. Hmm. I did play there with the early the pre Thad Jones Mel Lewis band. Thad had a band was Thad Jones, uh, Pepper Adams, uh, Roland Hanna, or Duke Pearson, Mel Lewis, and I was the bass player in that band. 
He played at Flux a couple of times. But other than that, my memory of being there was pretty pretty vague, and I don't remember playing with that kind of ensemble, but that specific hmm. personnel ensemble. Thanks for verifying that, because I did look into it, and it seems that all there really were were tweets talking about it from, I think one was a uh, Jazz Times journalist. But yeah, thanks for verifying that. And on the topic of um, uh, playing at clubs, Out West asks, uh, what are your favorite past and present venues to play at? I'm not sure how many are still left, but I like playing Catalinas in Los Angeles, uh, the club in, uh, o in, in Oakland, Yoshi's. Yoshi's. Uh, the the Village Vanguard in New York, uh, the Blue Note in New York. Mm. Um, uh, Blue Note in New York, Village Vanguard. Uh, Smoke's a very nice small room in New York on the Upper West Side. Mm. I've got a nice sounding piano. The, the, the management makes sure that the sound is right in the room with the microphones and stuff. There are a couple of rooms like that in New York, but by, by, by and large, most of the clubs I would remember, I'm not sure they're still standing mm. you know, after this terrible time we, went, we, we are still continuing to go through. And it's really unfortunate. Um, is, is there anything in particular um, that makes the club appeal to you? Well, there are a lot of things they don't have that makes it dis dis disappointing to me. They don't have a dressing room. Mm. They don't have a warm up room. They don't have a they don't maintain the piano until you insist on it. Those yeah. are the things yeah. that I look for first when I go to a club. Uh generally the club owners don't really know how to maintain a physical environment for the band. And uh, sometimes when you ask them to do certain things, they think, Why should I do that for you? And so those kind of club owners not are not my friends. So you think a lot of it I suppose would be a matter of respect. In it's, the way it's a business. Going. It's a business. So respect is, a, is what, a, a word, I guess we could fit. But if they don't respect, if they don't have concern for the entertainment, entertainers, who they're hired to bring in more business, if they're unwilling to make the environment more compatible with the entertainers' need. And they won't be around very long, so I don't consider myself worried about those guys because they're making it tough for themselves. Hmm. Chloe asks, when listening to an album for the first time, is there anything that you pay attention to the most? That's a pretty broad question. I wish that she'd be more, she, I guess. Uh, I listen to the form of the song. I listen to how present the bass is. I listen to see uh, is it an original or a standard? I listen to see how long the song is. I listen to see are they playing in tune with each other, hmm. as well as the pitch of the, the real pitch of the band. And, and does the bass player sound present enough to be able to affect what those guys are doing, let alone the listener who's in the audience like I am? Yeah. So it's always a very active form of listening to you. I'm 24 7. Mm. What are you listening to at the moment? You. Hmm. <laughs> what were you listening to, or what do you plan to listen to this evening? Uh, I made a record with Houston Person, uh, Grady Tate, Dr. Lonnie Smith, Eric Gale called In the Tradition. Okay. I'm going to spend my because it's a wonderful record. I'm going to spend my time tonight listening to how I had a great time playing with these guys who trusted my judgment. Yeah. I'll check that out. Yeah, please. Especially yeah. the first four bars of the saxophone solo on Eric's Gale. Okay. Killing, killing. Thank you for that recommendation. I'm really looking forward to that now. Um, Rufus the second asks, what makes a drummer stand out to you? And uh, who have been some of your favorite drummers to work with? They're all my favorite because they all play enough different to give me free lessons. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I've tried to make sure that, that we're on the same page rhythmically, harmonically, all that regular stuff. But they ha I have to feel that they're trusting what I do to help them sound better. And sometimes my comments about the pitch of the bass drum or the tom tom, no one has ever told them how detrimental they can be to the bass player's presence 
in the band, and, and they're kind of taken aback by this guy over here telling me how to tune my drums. I said, well, man, in this band right now, I'm the only help you're going to get. Let's get this party started. And uh, ultimately, they would trust my judgment, and we have a great time the rest of the night. Hmm. Um, Kismet asks, hi, Mr. Carter, how much comping from piano and guitar do you like in your solos? And then they've made something of a statement saying sometimes bass solos can drop momentum and force rhythm section players to play lighter in the higher registers. I suppose, to what extent do you agree with that? And what's your take? Can, can you make that fewer questions? I'll try to answer them all. <laughs> how much, how much comping, uh, how much accompaniment do you like from piano and guitar during your solos? I need the same help that they need when they're playing a the solo. Hmm. And uh, do you think that um, it's always necessarily the case that um, rhythm section players are forced to play lighter and in higher registers during bass solos? Uh, I have to hear a sample of that. I, I can't imagine that being the case. Hmm. Higher being on higher and higher in volume or higher in range on their instrument. I'm not quite higher sure. In range. Higher in huh? range. Higher I, I don't I, I don't know those situations, so it's kind of hard to relate to that kind of question. Okay, thank uh, you. I, I mean, if they, if, they, if the bass player goes above open G string, does that mean that the piano player is going to play like a cellist? And if drummer is going to start playing, I mean, I don't know, that's the kind of a question that's a, there's not much to do with that kind of question except say, I'm sorry, I can't answer it. No worries. Thank you. Um, Shion asks, what was it like working with Jim Hall? On alone together. Um, Jim and Jim Hall. Now, if the, if this person would consider um, me and Jim, Jim and I, duo as a job, rather than just a duo, hmm. say Jim Hall's uh, uh, job would be to kind of scratch out some arrangements, and my job would be to make them work on the bandstand. Yeah, and we had a great time. I miss him dearly. It it seems that you take a, a very much kind of occupational based approach to uh, playing your music, um, kind of in the sense that everybody has uh, a role to fill and everyone is there um, in a kind of supportive capacity. Um, I, I suppose from other musicians who I've spoken to in the past, maybe more so than them, uh, where they consider it more of a, uh, they don't necessarily know what to expect when playing with other musicians. Um, but you always, from your perspective, it sounds like you always very much know exactly what your job is going into these situations. Would that be an accurate observation? You make it sound really complicated, and it's really not that complicated. I know, yeah. <laughs> when, when, when my students ask me about going to work every night I t or with strange people, a new band, for example, mm. I tell them, I'm, I'm used to that, as you could tell by my recorded history, I guess, as a start. I tell them, I always make sure I leave my ego at home and take an extra pair of ears to this gig. Mm. If you can do that and, and, and are honest with yourself as your efforts to make this band work, we have a good time. Hmm. We have a comfortable time. Nice. Um, Wes asks, uh, again, kind of along the lines of playing with other musicians, what was it like playing with Paul Desmond? Um, I think this is a favorite player of his. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I enjoyed playing with Paul because he listened to every note I played. Hmm. And he understood if he didn't get it right the first chorus, and I know you missed it, that I'd come back around and give him one more chance at it. Hmm. And we had a great, great, he's really an intellectual player for me in that uh, he was always playing ahead in his head. And his lines always worked for me. I, I loved listening to him play, and I, I liked hearing him. I enjoyed hearing him weave in and out of the solo. And it made a lot of fun for me to play with him because I could direct him wherever I thought he needs to get in the solo and he would take my chance take his chances and i'd be right most of the time hmm. um tunlock asks 
what is your advice for horn players in terms of listening and interacting effectively with the bass player? And is, it, is there anything that horn players should know? Wait, 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 wait. That's about three questions already. If you can stop doing that and just kind of put, put some periods in your sentence, I can try to get them all answered best I can. But when you go uh, questions like one, two, and three in the same pair, it's hard for me to, to, to satisfy the questioner, quit the question posing person. So just go back to the same question. You just do the first sentence and stop. Yeah. Stop. Um, <laughs> what is your advice for horn players in terms of listening and interacting effectively with the bass player? Period. Period. Okay. Full stop. Uh, I, try, I try to have them not try to play the solos they worked on at home on this bandstand. Because in theory, they won't work because the guys who are playing with live, they, weren't at, they were not at your home when you worked the solo out. Hmm. And there are a few things more frustrating to the other guys and the other band members. When they hear the person playing the solo, they knew he worked out at his house. So it's up to those guys and gals to trust their environment and take something from this information that's coming around them from the remaining members of the band, the other horn players, the piano comping, the bass player's notes, the drummer's rhythms and the sound of the drums. I think they become so isolated at home, they forget that their solo at home works because it's just them. Mm. If, if you could sidestep that attitude and look around at all this information coming at them, they'll find them so overwhelmed with new ideas, they probably would play half as long. Mm. Now the next sentence. Is there anything horn players should know more about when playing with a bass player? Understand what a bass line really is. I think they hear the beat, they hear the sound more or less, but they're not really aware of the notes that this person is playing and the effect that each note has on what the soloist is doing. They're really great players, man. They understood this. It was really fun playing with them because I, I, they allowed me to develop whatever I'm hearing because he gave me the space as I was accompanying them to do these kind of unusual notes or rhythms. So some worked, some didn't, but they understood I'm looking like they were. Hmm. Um, Seed Munch uh, asks, when you're instigating chord substitutions or making a harmony more implicit with your bass lines, how much of that is instinctive? Well, ultimately, it all is because we're all improvising. Mm. And, and I think, again, once to the previous question, any line I might work out at home, it works out then because it's just me and my home. You know, uh, I, I, I think that when I'm playing these alternate changes and alternate rhythms, I'm playing them for the first time with that band. But I may have tried them somewhere else, a different group, a different kind of different setting. So the idea is while they may be new in terms of to them, that's the development of an idea that started six months ago or a year ago. But if they pay attention to what's coming on from this person behind them, they'll be surprised at how that's evolving as they're playing the solo. Now, I've, I've told several guys occasionally that you, know, you play a nice solo, but you play, you stop your solo when you're through. I'm playing a line behind you. I'm playing another conversation. Mm. And you're not allowing me to finish my conversation because you think you're through. Well, you may be through, but if you trust me, I got some more sentences for you if you allow me to get them in. Hmm. Yeah. That that's really interesting, actually, from the perspective of, of a saxophonist. Um uh, I suppose is yeah, that's not something that I've really considered, which I guess is maybe a little bit narcissistic of me. But um yeah, the idea that there is, when you're soloing, it is more of the conversation as opposed to when you're finished saying what you have to say, not necessarily. Yeah, I, I, and guys are not, some of soloists, they lose sight of that in, in playing what they think they hear or worked out at home. And I can appreciate that. But there's still another conversation going on that you should be a part of. Hmm. Um, and... Greg, Greg O'Loughlin says, you've been excessively cutting edge for decades. Are there any non-musical practices which help you stay connected with the parts of the world that are so new and emerging? I have no answer. To the question is, is so broad. 
Because mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know how to respond to it other than saying it's a very long question. Yeah, I suppose uh, in a rephrasing of that, you've always been relevant throughout your entire career uh, across every generation. Um, and, and you've answered before your approach to that is you just take things as jobs as they come. So I guess I would ask, how does it feel to be relevant to every generation musically? Great. <laughs> nice to be loved by everybody. Yeah. Uh, it's nice to know that people will go back and listen to do some uh, record listening research, for example, you know, now that YouTube is available and all those things are available much more than they were 20 years ago, they have a chance to find out what went on before them. Hmm. And my name may pop up one time, you know, and other people may show up, pop up two times. They have a chance to view the history of their instrument or the view of their, their music that they play, where they got started and who was paid for, who were the players who were helping this music uh, become more per more important because they were uh, determined to make it more relevant. Yeah, uh, It's nice to be a thought of a person who helps bridge those gaps. Mm. And like I was saying, our audience today is all very young, so it's... Well, how, do you, how do you young? 12, 13, 16? What is young? Um, I, I think I'd say our average is probably 18 to 20. That's medium young. Medium young. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> medium young. Wesley's just said I'm 17. I'm 20 <laughs> medium young. So medium, medium young. young. Yeah. yeah my, my grandsons are three years older than that. So he's medium young. Okay. Um, and I guess uh, it really has been an honor having you here today. And we just had one more question asked. Sure. Um, so I think we might finish on this one. Okay. Um, how do you feel about your upcoming 85th birthday celebration at Carnegie Hall on May the 10th? Um, it's a little early for me to get excited. This is only February 25, 26, something like that. Yeah. I'll start getting, I'll start getting excited around May 1 and 2. That means that we come down home stretch and these people who are putting the concert on and the audience who is coming from everywhere to see this concert, they're expecting a celebratory treat that they've been invited to. Mm. They've been invited to a very personal party with 2,500 other people, strangers, yeah. most of them. <laughs> and and, and uh, my job, here we go again, is to find the best notes that I can find to make those people who I'm playing with, Russell Malone and Donald Vega for the trio, uh, James Green, Irene Rosnes, and Peyton Crosley for the quartet, and for the four cellos and the rhythm section of uh, Donald Vega, Uch and bass and Peyton Crosley to help this people who will come to hear this three views of my music and corresponding group sizes, glad that they took the day off hmm. and got to Carnegie Hall to see this guy with this thing called a string bass on stage, manhandle this music. I'm <laughs> very excited, but yeah. I won't get excited until May two or three. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Carter, it's been yes, a pleasure sir. having you. Thank you. All you got to remember, Alfie, make the questions shorter. I will. I'll bail that, 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 that way you get long answers. Yes. <laughs> thank you for that. Thank, thank you for your time and your interest. Thank you so much. Take for your care. Time. You too.